Hello, my name is Colin Goldberg and today is Monday, October 3rd, 2022. I'd like to welcome you to the first Techpressionism Roundtable discussion entitled Curators in Conversation. To get started, I'd like to introduce my guests, Helen A. Harrison and Christiane Paul. Helen, ha Helen A. Harrison is a former New York Times art critic and NPR arts commentator. She's the current director of the Pollock Krasner House and Study Center in East Hampton, New York. A specialist in modern American art, Harrison has served as the curator of the Parish Art Museum and Guildhall Museum and was guest curator at the Queens Museum. Her books include Hampton's Bohemia, Two Centuries of Artists and Writers on the Beach, as well as monographs on Jackson Pollock and Larry Rivers, and three mystery novels set in the New York art world. Christiane Paul is professor of this in the School of Media Studies at the New School, as well as curator of digital art at the Whitney Museum of American Art. She is a recipient of the Thoma Foundation's 2016 Arts Writing Award in Digital Art. Her writings include A Companion to Digital Art, published by Blackwell R Wiley in 2016, Digital Art, published by Thames and Hudson, with editions in 2003, 2008, 2015, and 2023, Context Providers, Conditions of Meaning in Media Arts, published by Intellect in 2011, with a Chinese edition in 2012, and New Media in the White Cube and Beyond, published by UC Press in 2008. At the Whitney Museum, she curated exhibitions, including Programmed, Rules, Codes, and Choreographies in Art, 1965 to 2018, Cory Archangel Pro Tools in 2011, and Profiling in 2007. Ms. Paul is responsible for Artport, the museum's portal to internet art. It's an honor and pleasure to have you both here today for this conversation. Thanks to provide so a bit of oh, you're welcome and welcome. You, welcome to you both. Um, to provide a bit of background on myself, um, my, back, my practice explores the relationship between technology and personal expression, bridging mul multiple disciplines, notably painting and digital media. I'm honored to have been a recipient of grants from the Paula Krasner Foundation and New York, State, New York State Council on the Arts. And currently I live and work in the Green Mountains of Southern Vermont with my wife, Donna, and our daughter, Aya. I first used the term Texpressionism in 2011 as the title for a solo exhibition in Southampton, New York. Texpressionism, which is the topic of our discussion today, is defined in Wiktionary as an artistic approach in which technology is utilized as a means to express emotional experience. Some of the philosophical framework around Texpressionism is outlined in the Texpressionist Manifesto, which I first published on Medium in 2014. This text was inspired by artistic manifestos of the past, including Marinetti's Futurist Manifesto and Breton's Surrealist Manifesto. Texpressionism was first described as a movement in the Wired article if Picasso had a MacBook Pro in 2014 and received its first television coverage in a 2015 episode of the PBS show Art Loft. The use of Texpressionism as a hashtag on social media has allowed technology-based artists to self-identify with the term. Since the summer of 2020, there have been over 49,000 posts published on Instagram using the hashtag Texpressionism. The use of the hashtag has functioned as a primary research mechanism in the curatorial process of developing an artist index, an online community for artists using technology in their work. Over the past two years, Texpressionism has developed into an online community including artists from over 40 countries. The project's development was inspired in part by the concept of social sculpture invented by the artist Joseph Boys. Texpressionist artists meet in regularly scheduled online salons to share work and discuss ideas. These recorded meetups are conceived of as a modern counterpart to, sur the, to the surrealist salons of the past. Anne Spalter, artist and author of Computer and the Visual Arts, published by Addison Wesley, has described Texpressionism as follows. Texpressionism is introduced as a new art historical term to describe fine artists using digital technology to convey subjective emotional content. Texpressionism dis distinguishes expressive fine art from such genres as digital art, which can, can include animated movies and video games, as well as from new media works that may not embody convincing artistic intent. The subjective lens of the individual artist, rather than the product of a corporate studio, is what connects Texpressionism to his predecessor, Expressionism. Expressionists presented the world from a subjective perspective, distorting it, to distorting it radically in order to evoke moods or ideas, 
seeking to express their emotional experience rather than physical reality. This past summer, I had the honor of curating Texpressionism's first large scale physical group exhibition, Texpressionism Digital and Beyond, which opened at Southampton Arts Center in Southampton, New York in spring of 2022. Texpressionism Digital and Beyond included the works of over 90 artists working with technology from more than 20 countries around the world, including Afghanistan, Australia, Belgium, Brazil, Canada, the Canary Islands, the Czech Republic, France, Germany, Hong Kong, India, Iran, Italy, Netherlands, Peru, Puerto Rico, Russia, Taiwan, Turkey, Uganda, Ukraine, and the United States. Notable contemporary artists featured in the exhibition, as defined by Wikipedia, included Victor Acevedo, Suzanne Anker, Frank Gillette, Clive Holden, Patrick Lichty, Chalda Maloff, Paul D. Miller, AKA DJ Spooky, Steve Miller, Joseph Nekvital, Michael Reese, Christine Shuley, Nina Sobel, Anne Spalter, and Nina Yankowitz. I'm gonna close this monologue, hopefully it wasn't too long, with a short drone fly-through video of the exhibition shot by my friend Joanna Steidel, who's a, a drone artist and fellow expressionist. And then I'm gonna open the uh, conversation with an introductory question for each of our guests. <laughs> going to um, open up the conversation now and I'm going to start with a question for Helen um, who is the exhibition's um, senior advisor. Um, what was it that originally interested you about the idea of Texpressionism? Well of course I've known you for a long time Colin and uh, watched your, your development and I think when you first approached me back in 2011, oh my gosh, that's 11 years ago now, uh, and asked me if I would contribute an essay to uh, the exhibition you were doing in Southampton, uh, I thought about the, the history, being a historian, of course, I looked back and thought about how artists had adapted technological change for their own personal purposes, rather than being sucked in by the technology itself as a means, as an end in and of itself, that it became a means to an end that was already a subjective approach, a subjective uh, desire on the artist's part to express himself or herself, and then find the appropriate technology or the appropriate means by which to do that. And of course, you can think specifically of Jackson Pollock who learned how to use liquid material in very expressive and inventive ways. But of course, he didn't invent it. It was a technology that he adopted through his exposure in a workshop uh, run by a Mexican muralist, David Alfaro Siqueiros. And Siqueiros came to New York in 1936 and opened what he called an experimental workshop with the aim of using modern materials and unorthodox techniques to express whatever 
uh, subjective uh, intent he had. And there are numerous examples of work that were done at that time using primarily uh, industrial materials, but especially notably liquid paint. And the fact that this uh, unorthodox material suited Pollock's needs is the paramount thing. It, it, as, as he himself said in an interview, it doesn't matter how the paint is put on, as long as something is being said. Technique is just a means of arriving at a statement. So the statement is paramount and the means are the end, uh, are, the, are the ways of achieving that end. And I think that when I saw your work and how you were approaching technology in this very expressive and personal and subjective way, that was the appeal for me. Thank you, I, I appreciate that response. Um, and so now I'm going to um, uh, have a question for Christiane, um, who um, sort of this came about to some degree because after the, uh, the exhibition, there was a panel discussion that was organized by the exhibition's media sponsor, James Lane Post, um, about Web3 and the blockchain. And um, Christian was a moderator on a panel called Art and Web3. Um, and some of the panelists, uh, or actually all the panelists were artists in the Texpressionism exhibition. So I was very pleased that um, she had gotten to see the show and I've been to the shows that she curated at the Whitney um, and um, was very happy to be able to, um, you know, have this conversation happen. So my initial question for Christiane is, having had a chance to experience the Texpressionism Digital and Beyond exhibition, can you provide your um, initial thoughts on the term Texpressionism and specifically how it may relate to art historical movements of the past as well as digital art at large? Thanks so much for the great question, Colin, and uh, also big thanks to you and Helen for your statements and making this conversation possible. I am going to share a, new, a few slides and I really want to get to the term of Texpressionism in relationship to art historical terminologies and uh, medium specificity and what it means to curatorial uh, practice specifically. So I just randomly uh, threw in this uh, slide from Tay. Helen already gave great definitions of uh, expressionism, as did you. And both of you highlighted that expressionist art uh, tends to focus on the emotional expression of subjective ideas. It was a break with representationalism. It was also deeply tied to abstraction. And if you look at this list that Tate gives here, then it also becomes clear that expressionism covered broad, broad territory and styles ultimately. You, know, you have anyone from Max Beckman and Paul Klee to Francis Bacon and Giacometti in here. So um, very, very different approaches. And I want to keep that in mind. And then coming back to your manifesto, Colin, and to the definition of text expressionism, uh, you state that this is an artistic approach in which technology is utilized as a means to express emotional experience. And here I have a few questions. Of course, it's always so difficult to draw the line um, between art that is or is not expressing, expressing emotional experience. Most artists tend to be deeply involved into their work and into what they're doing. You know, there's always emotional investment. Whenever people ask a writer about whether their work is autobiographical or not, many of them would say, well, you know, it's not real events, but all I write is autobiographical because it's me and my emotional experience here. So I want to tie this a little bit to the um, definition of digital art. And that actually differs quite a bit from the one you um, quoted from Anne Spalter 
whose work I really deeply uh, admire and she's a great colleague. Yeah. So in its narrow definition, digital art is art that is created, stored and presented by means of digital technology. So um, created by means of the technologies then stored um, on drives, presented on screens, etc. Not quite overlapping with what we've seen in the text expressionism show. Yeah? And art um, that is created by means of digital technologies and uses characteristics of the medium, once again, that applies to the narrower definition. It would be computable, interactive, real-time, generative. And a few of the works in the text expressionism show are, but not all of them. Yeah. And um, it could also be seen in a broader definition as art that is uh, created by means of digital technologies and presented as an object that reflects on the digital medium. This is a more recent material term that we have seen often described as the post-digital. Uh, younger artists in particular have been using digital technologies to create, let's say, sculptures or paintings that never could be created in any other way. Um, but they present themselves as an object we may be used to in terms of art historical references, but that work also reflects on the digital medium. And that to me is a crucial distinction and cutoff line that I think conflicts a little bit with text expressionism. So I think the main distinction we need to make in digital art is art using digital technologies as a tool for the creation of an art object. And I would argue that most of the work you're seeing in galleries today uses technologies as a tool, be it a digital printer, be it um, CNC milling or CAD models for a sculpture. Frank Stella has been using digital technologies for a long, long um, time. But that work does not necessarily reflect conceptually on the medium and engages with it. And to me, that is a necessity for digital art, which also means that what we're seeing in uh, text expressionism transcends digital art. Um, by definition, I think it would also cover part uh, of the work that uses the technologies as a tool. Uh, I'm using a few screenshots from the virtual tour of the text expressionism show here. And one thing I also would like to highlight is that we're seeing so different media. So in the center here, we have uh, Michael Reeves augmented reality um, work relating to sculptural work. And then we have many, many different forms of print, screen-based work, et cetera. Uh, here. And I think that work does not always necessarily make a statement about the digital medium. It goes um, beyond it. So one of my questions as a curator would be, where uh, do we draw the lines here? Because medium specificity is so important to me as a curator in making uh, crucial distinctions between works. I am all for building art historical connections. And I think it is very important to see abstract digital work in the context of um, expressionism. I tried to build some of those connections in the exhibition you mentioned, program rules, codes, and choreographies in art from uh, uh, which was uh, mounted at the Whitney Museum in 2018, 2019. And um, the show, which I co-curated with Karen Mancusi Ongaro and Clemence White was basically looking at two art historical trajectories. One of them conceptual art. And you see here one of Solowitz's uh, stru structures in the foreground, Donald Judd in the background. And towards the back, you see uh, work by let me go back, Casey Rears, I'll talk about it in a second. And then the um, other part of the exhibition focused more on the algorithmic or programmed rearrangement of moving image sequences and messing with signals and resolution. 
And I just want for a second to stay with Casey Rears, which um, is, yeah, kind of interesting to consider within the concept of expressionism. Casey is one of the artists who from the start has drawn a lot of attention to the coded back end of digital art and built connections to conceptual art. So we have here on the right Solowitz wall drawing and on the left work by Casey, which was originally um, shown on the web, a commission for the art board uh, website. So two software structures here that start with written instructions. And of course, there are, they are abstractions. They are highly conceptual work, but I think they would also be, by your definitions, a form of expressionism because there is a lot of emotional um, content expressed here. So I just want to problematize the term a little bit and uh, see where the boundaries of it lie. And finally, um, I also want to talk a little bit about Artboard and the work I'm doing there. Once again, I would say that by your definition, so many of the works would um, qualify as expressionism and the artists may not necessarily align themselves with um, the term. So as part of Artboard, which features a lot of commissions, we also do the Sunrise Sunset series, and that is work that every morning and every evening at Sunrise Sunset time in New York disrupts the Whitney.org website for 30 seconds. And I'll just show you one example by La Turbo Avedon, which was this overlaid mirror onto the website. And what you see in the mirror is a fly through of an apartment that La Turbo constructed. So there are seven different morning and seven different evening mirrors or fly throughs. And the work was also highly emotional in that it captured our experience during the pandemic, questioning the thresholds here between um, the online and offline world. So you're not quite sure what you're seeing through this uh, mirror. Are you looking into someone's apartment or could it be seen as a reflection of your own uh, space? So I'll stop um, sharing here and return to the discussion. So more questions than answers, but I'm really interested in diving deeper into this. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thank you so much for um, for the, the slides and, and the discussion so far. Um, so that, that pretty much leads into my next question, which is a solicitation of questions. Um, um, so I wanted to open this up to, to the two of you. Um, would either one of you have any specific questions for each other or for myself on the topic of text expressionism to expand our dialogue? And then I figure we can just sort of let the conversation develop organically from there. Well, I think Christiane really hit on a, a crucial point, which is where are the boundaries? Should there be boundaries? Mm -hmm. uh, is there a uh, some way of determining how much subject subjectivity is injected into the the ultimate image or the ultimate uh, work of art, whether or not the technology is contributing to that? I mean, you could think of certain, well, like for example, in your exhibition, Colin, you had printmakers. Uh, printmaking is a technology, it's not a digital technology, but it could be. But the kind of technology that was, I, I guess, primarily the fore foregrounded in the show was digital technology and some of it animated as well. In fact, in your fly through, you showed Nina Yankowitz's uh, two panel animation and you could only do that digitally that there's no other way, but could she have achieved the same kind of image result using a different technology? That's a, also another question is, are, is this technologically specific or can it be translated into other media? Yeah, I think you raise um, a lot of great questions, uh, Helen, and that was precisely what I was trying to get to. So first of all, um, just reiterating your important uh, point, of course, all art is technological, ultimately. Paint is a technology, you know, photography, of course, printing. So um, artists have used technologies for 
centuries, but then those technologies also have very different uh, qualities, obviously. One thing I like about expressionism is that as a term, it could also transcend boundaries. And um, in terms of the question of whether we need to clearly delineate things, I'm all for openness. And uh, I think expressionism already fulfills an important function if there are artists aligning themselves with that term and finding a platform to discuss issues relevant to their work. That's always, yeah, I think, um, a function that makes a term valuable. In terms of um, digital art curation, I also need to make a set of other distinctions. Uh, I mean, paint, of course, is a medium, painting is a medium that has so many different genres, but I think digital technology has really increased the range of forms. Uh, if you think about virtual reality, augmented reality, software art, massive installations, networked or not. So those are all very, very different manifestations. So I think there's more variety within the digital. And in order to discuss its aesthetics, art historically, I think I need to introduce more distinctions into that umbrella of text expressionism. Well, what kind of distinctions did you do you foresee? Well, first of all, coming back to what I said, one of the main uh, distinctions for me is that between the tool and the medium. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And I don't want to belabor um, any form and, and content distinctions. To me, those, of course, always collapse. You know, <laughs> you use a specific form or medium to express conceptual issues and the two of them um, ultimately cannot be sep separated. Uh, uh, an artist has a reason why they make their work as a sculpture and not as a photograph because mm -hmm. the sculpture best expresses what they want to express. Uh, that being said, yeah, there are um, artists who use digital technologies as a tool in the creation of a work that uh, maybe speaks to abstraction, it speaks to maybe expressionism in some ways, but it is not a, a statement and not conceptually engaging with uh, the aesthetics of the digital per se. To me, that's a major um, distinction. Mm -hmm. So you ha could have a photograph that is deeply digital and that it gets to um, issues of the digital and place with a representational spectrum within that framework and others where clearly the technology is predominantly a tool. Yeah, like, isn't, that, isn't that the distinction that some, sometimes the technology can overwhelm the content, that the oh, technology becomes, it, it be, you know, it, it, it kind of sucks all the oxygen out of the image. Oh, absolutely not. So this is precisely what I do not mean, you know. Um, that would be accusing Pollock of sucking the oxygen <laughs> out of paint because, you know, what he's doing here is putting so much emphasis on the process itself and what that is. Good digital art by nature is not techno fetishism, yeah. But uh, I think most augmented reality pieces make a statement about their representational status. Yeah? How do they, they interact with the real world? Michael Reese's work is a perfect example of that. And I would not say that he's overwhelming us. No, he's getting to important uh, issues within what he's doing. So I wouldn't want to um, collapse the distinction I'm making into technological overwhelming. I'm talking really about engaging um, with conceptual issues related to the medium versus um, using it as a, um, as a tool. That some, I mean, a lot of sculptures that are created on the basis of CAD models, or maybe even through CNC milling, they do not speak about the digital per se. Yeah. 
and so they do not want to a, be seen that way. Like a, a balance that there that there has to be a balance between the technology and and what it's expressing. No, I I'm simply trying to make a distinction um, in order to define digital art. Mm -hmm. uh, so a photograph in a gallery that has been digitally printed to me is not digital art. Right. The same as, you know, a scan of a Mo the Mona Lisa on the web is not mm -hmm. digital art. You know, mm -hmm. here we're, we're dealing with a remediation or with a tool and that functionality, you know. Well, well it's also a reproduction. That's a reproduction of something else rather than original. Uh, yeah, digital yeah. Work. so the, um, I mean, the Mona Lisa was another example because that gets to remediation, uh, you know, but um, using the technologies um, just as a tool, and I don't mean that uh, in any discrediting way, um, but using it as a tool to create a more uh, traditional art object that speaks more to painting, photography, or sculpture than it does to the digital. That to me is a dividing line for digital art. Mm -hmm. I would not include a work in a digital art show just because it used some digital process in its making. You know? mm -hmm. And I'm arguing here purely art historically and aesthetically. Um, I think there's a different set of aesthetic vocabulary that I would apply to one versus the other. Mm -hmm. I mean, I could speak to that um, a little bit in terms of the sort of origin story of the term for me, um, which which kind of came about, um, you know, it sort of started when I was in graduate school before the term was anything that I had used. Um, when I saw that, you know, as I was doing my MFA in computer art and the undergraduate program had already been renamed to digital art, but within the sort of realm of academia, the concerns of many of those younger students enrolled in the digital art program was really to be a practitioner of commercial digital art, that is to go out into commercial studios like Pixar, um, work in video game studios and apply their skills. And, you know, there were, then that was sort of the way that nomenclature was used in some, in some settings, say in an academic setting. And I, you know, I felt strongly, um, you know, that, I was there for a different reason, you know, I was there creating art objects and uh, like the, the work behind me, you know, it, as you were speaking, it made me, made me think that, you know, the work I really consider um, to be painting in that it's work on linen with acrylics that has um, a digitally drawn component that's overprinted and then overpainted. So much in the way that the um, uh, pop artists like Rauschenberg might've used photo silk screen, I'm employing digital printmaking. Um, in, in sort of an abstract expressionistic way. And, and the term expressionism was invented because I felt that digital art wasn't a, an accurate descriptor of my own work mm -hmm. in the sense that, um, you know, it didn't feel comfortable to me to call it digital art when it's a work on linen that involves digital processes. Um, but, you know, that being said, um, the two paintings behind me, the, the larger pieces are part of a, a series called my wireframe paintings that do directly reference um, the language of digitality in, in the sense that, you know, they um, have elements, the digitally drawn elements um, definitely derive some of their aesthetic from CAD drawings and things of that nature. So um, I could sort of see it, you know, both ways, but it's interesting. Um, you know, to hear about the idea of digital art being something that's uh, referencing the medium itself in terms of the subject matter. Um, and, you know, the, the definition of text expressionism as far as work that has an emotional component, that is extremely difficult for anyone to determine externally, you know? So part of what I think has been really interesting for me over the course of this project is finding those moments where people have, have literally come to me and said like like I feel like I found my tribe here like this is this word speaks to me it describes what I'm doing um there was one artist um Davante Bradley Davo who came in and he was the moderator of most of our early salons and you know my interaction with him my initial interaction with him was was pretty much of that nature and when we corresponded and then spoke over the phone it really gave me a feeling that there was something you know, important here 
to be done in terms of the fact that artists were self-identifying, um, you know, with the term, and and that you know gave me sort of the um, you know the fuel to to keep it going, so to speak. Well, I remember when Anne was speaking at one of our salons, she was talking about how taking her work to a gallery and um, offering it for exhibition and everyone was very thrilled with it and really loved it. But when they found out that it was digital, uh, that, that it was you know done in a reproductive medium, so to speak, they, they weren't interested because printmaking and things, reproductive technologies in general are devalued in the art world or certainly have been for you know, up until now. Although with the rise of NFTs, I, I don't know if it could be a whole game changer as far as attitudes go. But the fact that uh, reproductive technologies are not considered serious in the art world is a real detriment uh, because it doesn't take into account the, the actual the actual image, the you know what what the artist is trying to say. If you want to go back to Pollock's definition of that, that art has to make a statement. That the statement is really the primary thing, and not how you got there, but what what, what you achieved in the end. Yeah, I think this uh, discrimination against reproductive technologies is changing and has been radically changing at least for younger generations now over the past couple of decades of course we're also still dealing with institutions where those categories are deeply inscribed you know mm -hmm. but i think that is definitely um eroding over time and i i think colin you also perfectly captures it as i said if people really find their term in text expressionism and uh, something that really deeply captures that practice that's wonderful and that uh, also means that a term like that needs to exist you know. and to your prior description of your work i think that was um a beautiful example for the distinctions i'm trying to make you know and once again they are distinctions that are more geared towards aesthetics and an understanding of the nature of the work if you're using technologies in layering paint on fabric and ultimately you know it's more important to you that this work exists painterly on fabric with the help of all of those um, technologies you know that to me falls a bit more on the tool side while the other um, paintings that you referenced in the back really speak much much more to the digital and um, its framework uh, and once again that's not a classification um, in terms of uh, value of uh, work it's really more about literacy and making um, distinctions because ultimately um, all of the boundaries would vanish. I'm by no means in the Greenbergian camp of, you know, <laughs> being hard set on medium purity and medium specificity. But in order to have literacy in media, we also need to see the differences and the range of expression. And we have always had that for painting. And um, I don't think it should vanish with the digital. Mm -hmm. And digital, you know, the the when Helen said a reproductive technology, I, my sort of my knee jerked because <laughs> generally, what you know, what I what I print on the linen, um, I would consider drawing in the sense that I draw it digitally on a tablet. But it it you know, um, I think digital uh, technology it's sort of um, unique in the sense. Well, maybe not not so much so. I mean, in terms of it being. A creative technology as well as a reproductive or a potentially creative technology as well as a potentially reproductive technology um, in the sense that things originate you know digitally um, and and like some of the work that I did back in the the 90s um, the late 90s and 2000s they were digital drawings and and I, I thought of the actual work as the, the the file you know like the the, the output the print was sort of a manifestation or a physicalization mm -hmm. of the work and now i've sort of um resurrected those pieces and started animating them into nfts because i feel like finally there's a there's i don't really know i would say you know an nft uh is a distribution mechanism or i've sort of 
described it in that way. Um, that I recently was, you know, in a in a Twitter sort of back and forth with um, uh, curator John Ippolito, who um, actually is the son of my undergraduate painting professor Angelo Ippolito, who who I studied under at Binghamton, and I thought it was really interesting. And he had posted something about NFTs, um, and there's you know. NFTs could span a spectrum of things that are conceived of as art to collectibles to all, all sorts of a variety of things. And, um, you know, to me, the term NFT describes a, a delivery mechanism, not even necessarily a medium per se. So, um, you know, I think that the, the, the timing of um, NFTs and their, their rise in popularity sort of aligned with the development of this project into a group. And I thought it was really interesting to watch that happening. You well, know, you, you say if it's, a, if it's simply a delivery mechanism, what's interesting to me about it is that it, you're really looking at two different parallel things happening. One is the development of technology for artistic expression, and the other is the marketplace. And if the marketplace accepts NFTs as a valid way of, of marketing and distributing uh, digital art or any other kind of art for that matter, I mean, not all of it is, is created digitally, but the idea that you that these things have value, have monetary value apart from expressive value, it, that, 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 that kind of convergence is, is very interesting because that really has not been the case up till now. I want to build on that a little bit. I know we could spend the last uh, three, uh, the next three hours, you know, talking about um, NFTs and we definitely do not have the time. But once again, I just wanted to uh, make some distinctions here. NFTs per se as non-fungible uh, non tokens are certificates of authenticity with a uh, smart contract and uh, metadata and uh, also a sales platform yeah so um to me also interesting that to some extent in the lingo the sales mechanism itself has been commodified yeah that being said you know there are distinctions to make between nfts that um consist ultimately of hanging jpegs on the blockchain which i'm not interested um in you know um, so JPEGs, which once again could just be images remediated of a physical um, artwork, for example. And um, to me personally, that is not interesting. I also find it frustrating that digital art gets conflated now very often with JPEGs or little animated clips. Yeah. But there are also artists and there have been artists uh, since 2014 who have been really using the blockchain as a medium. That to me is interesting about NFT art and that is when NFTs and the blockchain becomes a medium. So within that spectrum of NFTs, we're once again looking at the pure certificate of authenticity and sales mechanism you know, for a JPEG and then uh, really work that uses the blockchain as a medium. So the kind of commercialization of uh, digital art or, or things that are created technologically really expands not only the market, but also the audience. I mean, you could not, Colin, you could not have put together the exhibition that you did and presented it the way you did without the internet and access to people all over the world who were able to send in their work on, because much of it was physical, but you didn't necessarily get a physical object. You, you got a file and you were able to create the physical object from that file. So this is a, a whole new way of, of putting together exhibitions and of presenting the work and making it accessible to people, collecting it and disseminating it. Yeah, I totally agree, Helen. Um, also, that has been going on, of course, when it comes to the internet as a platform for distributing art since the 90s, of course. Uh, so NetArt came about in the early 90s. 
and um, we have seen representation of art and the widening of art audiences and web-based art for the past um, 30 years, definitely. Digital art also has been collected uh, for decades and decades, but um, the market now has really changed um, through NFTs and that attention that has been brought to it. I also want to make um, very clear, looking at the statistics of it all, that there is only a relatively small overlap in the Venn diagram of NFT collectors and um, the collectors who become really invested into and interested in digital art. That's mm. only a certain segment and a relatively small segment mm. of that whole um, group. But um, certainly, you know, it's been a big advantage that digital art, whether misunderstood or not, has been all over the press, you know. Well, if it provides a platform for artists to get their message out, and even, even if it doesn't result necessarily in sales or in, in the kind of art world, quote unquote, success that a traditional art um, expression would, I think that it, it just really opens up a whole new avenue for people to connect and to, as, as Colin said, you know, people say, well, I found my people. This is this is where I, I I was kind of shooting in the dark, and now suddenly I'm with a whole group who agree with what I'm trying to do and who are sympathetic and supportive, even if that support doesn't translate into money. Yeah, uh, I absolutely agree, and not only money, but also understanding of um, of the work, you know, because um, once again, many of the NFT collectors are not inter not necessarily interested in art or the um, aesthetics and you see a lot of uh, flipping which you do not see when it comes to art collection um, per se you know like the serious art collector art collectors sure at some point they might put them at ease you know on the on the market but many of them are holding on to the work because they feel a deep connection to it. And that's actually been the same uh, with NFT collectors who are deeply invested into the artist and um, connected to the work. They're not going to resell to make a 200% profit. Absolutely. And as an artist myself, you know, I find that um, just the ability for a visual artist to um, you know, receive a royalty payment on a secondary market sale is is a pretty big deal. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I couldn't really wrap my head around it until I had my first secondary market sale. And it was a small royalty, but it happened completely automatically when the work was resold to another collector. And that illustrated to me, like, sort of how powerful that is in terms of, you know, um, it sort of has changed the the model, I think, in, in many ways. And it seems like the the art market um, and the NFT market, they're definitely two very separate spaces. Um, oh, yeah. And, no, they they tried know. to do that. Uh, I think it was in California, if I remember correctly, that when an artwork was sold, that the artist, uh, uh, you know, a, a painting or a sculpture, a traditional artwork, that the artist would get a cut. And it was unenforceable. Right. Yeah, but we also have to be aware of the fact that this is a, um, a U.S. issue. It is mm -hmm. legislation in other countries, mm -hmm. and it seems that um, in the U.S. it was only possible to achieve this through the market itself and mm -hmm. um, through the NFT landscape. This is also what motivated um, Kevin McCoy and Anil Dash in 2014 to present their monographs, proto NFTs at the new museum in New York. It was about uh, resale rights for um, artists. You know, and at the time it didn't take off partly because the technological framework wasn't uh, there yet. Mm -hmm. But I find it interesting that this seems to be um, the way of getting it done. You know, in, yeah. in other countries, it has been done through legislation. Wow. Because, I mean, yeah, as, as an artist and not 
identifying as necessarily curator, even though I have this limited experience or an art historian, you know, I'm um, often reminded that when I look through an art history book, there is really no work in there that isn't, you know, um, there because it has become, uh, you know, valued. That is, you know, it's 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 achieved and sustained value over time, um, and that's you know a component of its, you know, historical relevance in some way. I wouldn't say that that's why it's there, but you, I but think it could be the other way around. It could be that the reason that it's valuable is because it's in the book. Right. That's how you built the canon. <laughs> you know? yeah. That makes sense. Well, this has been, um, I think we're coming up on time here, but it's been a really fantastic conversation. Um, and um, I really want to thank you all, uh, the two of you, um, for, for coming today. And um, yeah, and if you, either of you have any last thoughts or... Well, I just want to say I, I really appreciate hearing Christiane's insights because the the this is a realm of media with which I am personally not terribly familiar, and I come to it from a different point of view. So just hearing what she had to say about those distinctions and about those nuances was was very eye opening. I really appreciate it. Likewise, Helen, it's uh, such a pleasure to discuss that with you and not in the typical ghetto and uh, get your deep art historical perspective on it. And thanks so much to Colin for making that happen. You know? Yes, and thank you, Colin. And for doing the exhibition, which I know was a real labor of love and a very complicated, many, many moving parts, but it came together brilliantly. Thank you so much, Helen. And thanks for all your guidance um, and advice through the through the years and in the project's development. So. Um, all right. Well, I would like to once again just thank you both and I will um, stop our recording now. <laughs>